So, welcome to the Baby Boomers, CUNY TV's half-hour look at one of the biggest and brassiest groups of folks ever to have blessed this planet. I'm Donna Hanover, and I'm a Baby Boomer. There are 75 million of us here in the United States, and right now we're between 49 and 67 years old. Quite an age spread, don't you think? Personally, I joined closer to the top end of that group and bounced right through those mind-shattering 60s. There I am, all long hair and bell bottoms, trying to find my role in a society full of contradictions. How would women gain equality? Where would the conflict in Vietnam take us? What was Woodstock all about? During this half hour, we'll more closely examine the historical and societal upheavals that shaped the baby boomers, and we'll look ahead to see how we'll cope with retirement, staying strong in mind and body, and where and how we'll choose to live. So rock on, baby boomers, rock on. Hi, I'm Lisa Beth Kovitz, and I'm a baby boomer. Born late October 1964, I am the tip of the tail of the baby boom. For those of us born between 1946 and 1964, life has brought some amazing historical and social upheavals. I saw the pictures of those four youngsters in the Evening Star the day after that tragedy. And I vowed then that we were going to find methods that would be more effective to deal with these problems of violence. We have the baby boom. And this population will grow and grow and grow. They will feel often, especially minorities and women and people who are not necessarily as privileged, will feel that they deserve something more. These kids are growing up in the 60s and they don't like what they see. And they are going to college in greater numbers because those opportunities present themselves. So these kids will go off in 1964 to start registering voters in the South. The Southern Christian Leadership Conference, which was jailed in Albany, but still won the battle, bombed in Birmingham, bitten by dogs, with water hoses turned loose on us, but we still came to bull after this Freedom Summer, they are going to return to their campuses and they're going to return to their campuses in droves. And they're not going to be willing to accept edicts handed down. When Newt Gingrich and Dick Armey say it was the worst time in American life, they're rejecting the Civil Rights Movement. They're rejecting the place of women in American life. These are not political issues. These are human rights issues. This is the underpinning of who we are as a country. We think the people of this country should be proud of these kids. Notwithstanding the way they dress or the way they wear their hair, that's their own personal business. Their self-demeanor cannot be questioned. The cork got popped and everything flew out of the bottle. You were going to be doing things differently than your parents, and that counted for a lot. On top of all this, we have not one, not two, but five assassinations. Those of us who loved him and who take him to his rest today pray that what he was to us, what he wished for others, will someday come to pass for all the world. And underlying all of this is the war in Vietnam, which will rage for the entire period of that decade. These things all play into each other, and they're all happening in the 60s. So the boomers said, we're going to change the world. We're going to make it a much better place. They changed the music scene. We went from Perry Como and Frank Sinatra to the Stones and the Beatles. We meant more to kids than Jesus did, or religion at that time. I wasn't knocking it or putting it down. I was just saying it as a fact. It was a, it was a head-snapping transition. A lot of the events lined up along a reasonably common axis, and the axis was retrenchment of old authorities versus uprising of new, hitherto suppressed or marginal uh, groupings. The changes that were happening were so significant and made such a huge difference in basically how we live right now. For me, as a kid with a comic book, the change came to my house eight times a year in the form of Mad Magazine. When I was younger, I think that I felt like I was getting away with something by reading this. And they were very funny, but we weren't allowed to take them to school or anything, you know, and I always liked to keep them with me. In a way, Mad Magazine asks itself what 
do we want to satirize? And the answer is... We satirize everything. The movies, ads. Med was one of the first to take on cigarettes. I, I, I think, in a way, Med has provided a small public service. Let's say the baby boom generation welcomed this kind of questioning, whereas a little before that, I think people were more apt to say, what are they getting at? They shouldn't be doing, they shouldn't be saying that. Nowadays, kids take the satirization of everything for granted. For the baby boom generation, the only place a kid could get this kind of satire was Mad Magazine. We were talk taught to respect authority, but we were also, it was a time when we were scared of authority. Uh, we talk about the 50s as giving rise to the beat generation, but that was also the beat down generation because it's the time of great conformity and people keeping a low profile because of what was going on in the country. Relevant to the charge which you have publicized that I am or have been a communist. Do you think that MAD helped make the counterculture? Yes. It couldn't be a counterculture without Mad Magazine, and today there would never have been a Saturday Night Live, a Stephen Colbert, an Onion without Mad Magazine. We talked to the singer Patti Smith, told us after Mad, drugs were nothing. Mad Magazine came along and said things are not always right, sometimes things are phony, but they also said, and this was the thing that no one could contend with, that things could be silly and absurd and just plain goofy, and kids woke up to that. As long as man gets the credit, I'll take it either way. This has been Lisa Beth Kovitz for CUNY TV. We wanted to see what today's younger folks thought about the infamous 60s with its drugs, booze, and rock and roll. So we threw down the gauntlet to an informal group of five that spanned the decades, and then we let the good times roll. I mean, I think, for me, definitely, I see the, I see the 60s as, as, for lack of a better term, the great liberation of sorts, or at least the start of, of, of a lasting liberation, mm -hmm. of an ongoing liberation. I mean, to be honest, we're not, we're not completely liberated. Will we ever be? Who knows? I find that, that of all of the, you know, throughout the 20th century, of all the eras to talk about, the 60s is always dominating all the time. You, well, it was you the know. most interesting. And it was, and, no, I mean, it, it, just it, it just, apparently. <laughs> um, and it just is. And I, and I guess that was really, was that really the turning point for so much stuff? Student protests, yes. civil rights, Vietnam War, all of, you know, all of those things. I don't know that, that we've seen an era quite like that. And is that why it's and so it, documented and talked about? It wasn't idyllic, but there was so much idealism. And so there was that passion and that idealism that, again, I haven't seen in, in the same intensity and shape mm -hmm. in succeeding generations and decades. I think it also appeals to all of the senses, too. Good point. You know? Yeah. I mean, yeah. it appeals to the visual sense and the fact that, you know, fashion and this explosion of, of color, of... Psychedelic. Of, Mini yeah, skirts. A, a, <laughs> Anything and everything yeah. uh, aesthetic and the the taste, I mean, the the rise of drugs. I think the baby boom generation, although we worry about the younger generation, we're, we kind of expect you to <clears throat> make your own path, go your own way, have your own problems. And, and whereas our parents really were surprised at the path we took. I think it was violently shocking. I was a preteen in the late 60s on the advent of the summer of love, but I grew up in a neighborhood with many kids my own age. And I just remember in, in a very quiet suburb, battles on the street. I remember to this day seeing a neighbor's daughter, you know, with an immigrant father screaming at each other on the streets. The divide was so so ugly and so sharp at the time. Uh, of course, for many of us, the Vietnam War was the crucible. It was the defining um, event, and it lasted a lot of years, and we lost a lot of our friends uh, in that. And when, when you people, when you younger people think about the Vietnam War, do you have any concept? To, of, of, and it also made us believe that the government can lie. Up until then, hmm. many people thought, well, if the government says, it's so, then it must be so. There was sort of a trust. Once Vietnam happened, there was, it really reduced credibility. What does the Vietnam War mean to you? 
when you do you have any kind of impression of what the Vietnam War was? I mean, when I think of the Vietnam War, I just I think that it it was a mistake, but not necessarily because that's what I think because I've done lots of reading about it, but that's the general idea that I've, you know, I've gotten from reading. I think a lot of the gener our generation looks to government through that lens of lacking trust, and I think a lot of that comes from you know, our, our, that era, and then, it, and then watching it c to continue, watching it continue through well, the years. The way it got repeated for the Iraq War. Ex and that but was the, but that in was a different way, because there make. was so much, because there was also the internet now, you know, right. at, that, at that point. Mm -hmm. um, and, and journalists were embedded with, with, uh, with troops and reporting back live. So it was very difficult, I think. I mean, I, the, the, the other thing with the Iraq War, frankly, was that you also saw that this government also doesn't listen to the people. Wasn't it the era of free love? Free love. You were bringing up the free love thing and sort of that era of experimenting and doing things before you were married. Well, by the time I was of that age, um, AIDS had started. And so that's, uh, that was the new thing for my generation. It was just sort of like free love. Let's put the brakes on that a second. You know, there was the saying, no glove, no love, <laughs> at the time. Um, and, you know, we're, I'm, not, I'm not making light of it, but that was very, very serious. It was very scary. Mm -hmm. um, and so that really did halt a lot of that mentality at the time. Right, right. Um, there were no meds like there are now. Now it's treated as a chronic illness and, you know, people get tested normally, but... It was a death sentence. You know, it was a death sentence. Was. Yeah, and it wasn't just mm -hmm. gays. It was, and then when it started to be everybody else, well, it was, uh, yeah. The baby boomers thought, oh, free love. Love is free. Love and is free. And then it turned out that actually it had, it it had a had cost. cost. It, it had a cost. cost. Yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned the civil rights because that was something that was, it, it, there were enormous advances in civil rights during the baby boom yeah. time, right? During the 60s. When you, look, when you look back at the history, what do you think? Well, I'm thinking in the 60s, I don't know so much. Well. The, the advance was that it was actually being talked about, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know. Um, that, was, that was a step forward, because it was sort of like the elephant in the room. I mean, it's, it finally, I think this country came to a point where, you know, something's got to be done here. It just can't keep going this way. Um, uh, so when I'm, you know, I wasn't born yet, but I'm looking back at, at, at documentaries and black and white footage, I can't even imagine that today. For lots of us, working hard and building careers has been central to our lives. During the last 20 years, U.S. Census data says the share of workers 65 and older still in the labor force rose from 12 percent to 16 percent. And lots of those folks, as well as younger baby boomers, are recreating themselves in the workforce. I'm Tina Beth Pina. From Mickey Mouse Club ears to the counterculture of the hippie generation, baby boomers have continually reinvented themselves, and it's never been more apparent than when it comes to their retirement. If enough of the baby boomers really get onto this encore movement and think about making sure that this last stage of work is going to have some impact in the world, they may be remembered uh, more for what they did in their 60s um, than in the 60s. Marcy Albauer is the author of the Encore Career Handbook, which looks at how baby boomers are exploring alternatives to traditional retirement. There seems to be two kind of uh, parallel narratives going on. There are the people who can't afford to retire because uh, they realize they're going to be living longer, their retirement accounts have been decimated, or they've been laid off. And then there are their people who, even if they've planned well and they can't afford to retire, they have no interest in retiring. We've added years where people are still healthy and vital and expect to be contributing. So this idea of moving to the Sun Belt, it's just not resonating for people anymore. The 55 to 64 age group is the fastest growing segment of the U.S. workforce. And according to the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics, almost one out of four workers will be 55 and older by 2018, a fact that doesn't always bode well with their younger co-workers. People tend to stigmatize older workers and say, well, you know, uh, they can't do the job or they're going to be absent more or they'll have health problems. Interestingly, the evidence is that older Americans actually are quite productive workers. Uh, and there's been some studies of this that show that they learn uh, quickly. Uh, they can master the new skills. So as I said, it's a, 
It's a stigma that's undeserved. You know. While this capable, highly educated, and sizable segment of the U.S. population is motivated to work beyond typical retirement age, others are forced into the door of reinvention. For me being laid off, although it made me angry, it was an opportunity to now find something that's meaningful for me. Losing a job, finding a life. When James Cunin was laid off from his corporate job, his new job search led him back to his hobby, teaching ESL to immigrants. Teaching English at LaGuardia, I don't have to leave part of myself at the door. How many people can say that when you go into work in the morning, that you can take all of you into your job, you don't leave any of you outside at the door? That's a job that lets you feel like you are fully you, and that's a wonderful feeling. James was able to take his passion, get some training in it, continue volunteering, and finally land a job. But not all baby boomers have that luxury. In the late 90s, everybody was talking about, They'll, I'll retire when I'm in my 50s, I'll make pottery, my 401k is fat, you know, I'm doing fine. And now older Americans are saying, wait a minute, my house is worth a third less than it was before. I had to use my 401k savings to support myself or maybe my children. Baby boomer Mae Wuthrich found herself thinking about how she and her husband could afford sending their 14-year-old to college in a few years. The economic realities of the times that we live in are just very different from our parents' generation. We knew that we were going to be putting a kid through college and um, they're just there is no thought of not working. So to cope with this uncertain economy, May used her film and publishing backgrounds to reinvent herself into a successful audiobook producer. I wanted to do something different. I wanted to continue to um, work. I wanted to continue to make money. And it was something that I wanted to try. And I didn't know what the outcome would be. Since I had been in publishing, um, I was able to meet with all of the big publishers and I got a job. And that was sort of the beginning of my journey. Although the reinvention journey that May and James found themselves on followed a different roadmap, their final destination was a successful second career. Depending on what you want to do, the path is different. So it's everything from doing some internal assessing and figuring out what it is you want to do, then to figuring out um, where there might be opportunities for you. And then there's usually a period of trying stuff out. It's just like what young people go through in their 20s. By 2030, 70 million Americans will be aged 65 and older and will comprise 20 to 25 percent of the total U.S. population, compared with only 13 percent today. Their retirements will dramatically affect the future of America's workforce. For CUNY TV, I'm Tina Beth Pena. There's no denying many of us are starting to notice a few silver threads among the gold. Baby boomers are racking up a lot of medical expenses these days, much of it in knee and hip replacements because we continue to work out and try to stay fit. Orthopedists call it boomeritis. But one area of special concern is underneath those silver strands, our brains. Mike Gilliam explores the latest thinking on how best to keep our wits about us. A lot of people think that as they get older, their minds will automatically become a little bit less sharp. But baby boomers, listen up. That does not have to be the case. Researchers now say that there are ways to improve your mind, even if we have some of those, what do we call them, senior moments. As we get older, our memory is not as good as it was when we're younger. It's a natural thing. Alzheimer's disease is a disease that's not aging, it's a separate disease that's associated with really bad memory and bad other cognitive functions. So the good news is that the great majority of people will not get dementia. Most people will lead a normal, healthy life uh, and age successfully. That's good news. Are there things though that I have to do to make sure that happens? The kinds of things that seem to be helpful but are not guaranteed are remaining active, exercise, a reasonable diet, social interactions. All of these things in these big population studies seem to be associated with more successful, quote, successful aging. So diet is important if you want to maintain proper brain health. And Stern says a good place to start is the Mediterranean diet, which includes fish, olive oil, fruits, and fewer carbohydrates. People who adhere to this Mediterranean diet do a lot better for almost every health outcome from heart disease to better cognition to reduced risk for dementia. Here at the McBurney YMCA, they know a few things about the exercise programs that are so important to baby boomers. In fact, they run a lot of classes here. 
Now, researchers have found that the important thing about exercise is that it increases blood flow to the brain. And they've also found that exercise changes the brain in ways they never imagined. If you exercise, that brain actually changes in shape. There are several studies showing that areas of the brain, especially towards the front of the brain, that actually seem to increase in size. And the people who do exercise actually get better at tasks that rely on that frontal part of the brain. When you talk about exercise, what are you actually talking about, though? Are we going to have to be on the treadmill for an hour a day? I'm, I'm talking about the studies have been aerobic exercise, walking, or something that raises the heartbeat rate. And it's not just exercise, but uh, other things too. Cognitive stimulation, environmental stimulation might do the same thing. Dr. Charles Mobs, a neuroscientist at Mount Sinai, agrees that keeping your brain engaged is critical. Learn, go to museums. Uh, memorize things if that is something that comes up in your life. I personally, I do theater, so I have to memorize a lot of things. The final thing is keep engaged, socially engaged, engage with your family, engage with friends. All those things make you emotionally healthy and that keeps your brain healthy. So what about people using brain games to try to stimulate themselves and try to protect their memories? The games are not bad. They can't hurt you. They could, prob they could be helpful, but you know, someone doesn't have to buy a game to be more active, to do the activities that they like, to, to read a book that they're interested in. It doesn't have to be intellectual. And do memory supplements work? I'm really not a fan of encouraging people to take supplements to uh, increase their memory. Anything that you really need in your diet, uh, you get if you eat a healthy diet. If you're not getting something you really need, your doctor will tell you what you need. You need a vitamin B supplement. And, and, and there's a chance that taking some of these supplements to excess can get in the way of your health as well. You know, what I always say is if you do pretty much what your mother told you to do, eat reasonably, take care of yourself, uh, stay active, those are, those are the, the, the key things that the research shows us are effective. So, just to sum it all up, baby boomer brain power improves when you get moving, develop new skills, and eat like a Greek. Easy, right? I'm Mike Gilliam for CUNY TV. So we're working harder and living longer. Where does that put us, literally? Where and how are the boomers living these days? We want options and choices in our homes. Are the boomers making a boom in the real estate world as well? I'm Andrew Falzone. As boomers reach retirement age, they have a very important decision to make. They have to pick the place they want to call home. We would never ever go into a traditional retirement place at all. Anathema. The Lawlers found that the area they lived in was considered part of a NORC, which stands for Naturally Occurring Retirement Community. Dr. Jeff Rosenfeld is a gerontologist at the Parsons School of Design's New School. He studies the social, psychological, and biological impact of aging. He's especially focused on the impact that retiring boomers will have on society and homes that are being custom designed for retiring boomers. These homes are featured in a book he co-authored called Unassisted Living. What boomers want is flexibility. They want spaces that can multi-purpose, and in particular, what they want is a spare bedroom. Early in their retirement, that will be a home office. It could also be a guest room for children. Later on, when they become more frail, it can be a place where a caregiver or nurse's aide can live. They're preparing for the future, but they're living life for today. Uh, for example, they may build a space where one day they could need guardrails, but they aren't putting the guardrails in yet. They're making this space where one day they might want to put in an elevator, but they're not adding it yet. Dr. Rosenfeld says many boomers are planning more of a second act than a retirement. Today's boomers are making different choices, largely because although they're retiring, they're not stopping. Uh, many are enjoying encore careers after they retire. They don't want to relocate. They just want to recalibrate where they are. According to Dr. Rosenfeld, NORCs can start in one of three ways. NORCs can begin when many people in the same area occupy the same homes for most of their lives and age in place, when young people in a community migrate away from the community, or when older residents migrate into the community. NORCs are naturally occurring retirement communities. It's places where people have aged in place. Um, it's not like Florida where people all move down there and everybody's old. 
some of the criteria is at least 50% of the population has to be over the age of 60. Karen Schwab is the Director of Older Adult Services at the Samuel Field Y in Little Neck, Queens. She says community organizations often write grant requests to the city or state to have a community recognized as a NORC. Grant money is then used to run supportive service programs, or SSPs. As part of her job, Schwab oversees three SSPs, providing a range of services to three NORCs in northern Queens and Nassau County. We very often will put in a volunteer that might do volunteer shopping. We work with some of our schools. But it seems like it's the little simplest things that really make the a difference. The changing of the light bulb. You know, we've had seniors in the dark, especially with Newark Wow, because they're in houses and it's too high for them to stand up to change the light bulbs. Norks come in all different forms. Residents of the Deepdale Nork live in garden apartments that provide a sense of community and provide a common area for social activities. Meanwhile, Pat and Jim live in a single family home, but their neighborhood is still considered a Nork and they have no plan to go anywhere else. It's not some kind of um, you know, governmental, rigid, paper-pushing agency. It's personal caring, genuine caring. Many people live within the confines of Newark and don't even realize it. If you live in the five boroughs and would like to get more information about Newark services in your area, visit the website at the bottom of your screen. I'm Andrew Falzone for CUNY TV. So thanks for being a part of our Boomer Barrage, and barrage it is. At this point, more than 10,000 baby boomers are reaching the age of 65 every single day. And this will continue to happen for almost the next 20 years. That's a lot of us with a lot of social implications. Glad you were able to join us. I'm Donna Hanover for CUNY TV.